I originally came here in 2002, uh, just on like back backpacking basically. That was like, my first experience in Australia. I came here for a year, met a few people, uh, and that was what gave me the idea to come back with Scotty and Byron in 2006. And there was a tour going on with Bliss and Esso, and basically we were in England, and Flago said, if you boys want to come over and do a tour, come on out. Was, of course I'm coming to Australia to make music and chill out for a year. So yeah, that, that's what brought us out here. Uh, well, I, when I got got here in 2006, obviously I'd been here in 2002, so I'd seen a little bit of the scene. Uh, it changed slightly in those four years. It was kind of getting into that whole kind of, you know, uh, Just Blaze kind of sound, that vibe, uh, a lot of people. But the scene was very similar to the whole English scene. You know, it was kind of traditional hip hop, that kind of vibe, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, a lot of, you know, wasn't really much of like it was definitely no grime sort of sound anyway man there was no grime like me and murky were trying to get people into grime we're trying to show them grime they didn't want to buy it bro at all they fucking didn't like it yeah it was non-existent in fact i remember in 2006 when we were out on one of the tour dates with bliss and so we were playing uh, um i think it was a risky roads music DVD, cd that came with the dvds we were playing that disc and um People were like, why are you not listening to Duff Duff? And I didn't know what Duff Duff was because I'd never heard that term before. We're used to drum and bass or dance or house or whatever the genre is, but never heard the word Duff Duff. They, they called it techno and they didn't, couldn't catch the beat and they didn't understand the, the pace or whatever. So it took a long time for people to warm up to it. People didn't know how to take it, I think. Like some, the hip -hop, some of the hip hop people were like, this is like, they were like, I heard some people say this is techno. <laughs> like, but basically it was the kind of that, there was that kind of vibe in many sectors of Australia at the time, anything electronic that was kind of doof music or something, you know what I mean? And that was the vibe a lot of people, a lot of people were like, we like the beats. I mean, we like the MCs, but we don't like the beats. It, it took a minute for people to get used to it. Yeah, I mean, a massive catalyst, me and Frax were talking about it recently, a massive catalyst for that was the dubstep movement. It's the first time people were really listening to people that could vocal over that tempo. Um, obviously, drum and bass has always done its thing, and people were aware of it. In England, it's massive, the amount of MCs and stuff in that genre. Um, but yeah, there was no grime in Australia in 06. Apart from a few DJs, true say, there were DJs that were spinning it. Again, very heavily English influenced. Lady Erica, she's from England, so she knew the music from the ground up. Um, but yeah, there were a few people spinning it, but it was not commonplace. Diamond Murky were the only ones that really seemed to understand the music and got into it. There was a couple, a few other people, don't get me wrong, but they were the guys that were really they were, they were as hype into it as I was. You know, the very first type day, I'll never forget it, I'm meeting Murky. I was in a bar, I'd just gone out to a bar to like, because I knew there was a hip hop night. I was wearing an Averex jacket, which is like a kind of grime status thing at the time. And he comes up to me and said he was gonna jack me for my jacket. And then I laughed and when we laughed together, and then we start, he asked me if I like grime and it went from there, you know what I mean? Like there wasn't anyone really into grime. So, you know, we just naturally, you know, we're true to each other, you know, and then with Diam as well, like, we're very similar, similar in many ways. We both got a Welsh dad, we both got an English family, we both so mad into like garms and that and shoes, and we just clicked like that real quickly, you know. Smash Brothers happened around 08. I think that was the first time that we'd sort of, the word Smash Brothers had come up. We were always friends with um, Diam and Murky anyway. But then the term Smash Brothers, and because they were so focused on grime, and obviously me and Ollie had a background of doing certain things in that genre as well, it just come together. And we found that the two Australians and the two English was a perfect blend for us. That, that gave a little bit of what the Aussies know, plus a little bit of the English and what we did. So there was a nice mix, and I feel like it was that gradual step up. I don't think, for example, somebody like Nerve could have come out of a grime single at that point in time, and it would have worked necessarily. But there was a gradual process to it evolving, so yeah. 08 and then 09 we started doing it and then 010 we started booking shows and doing all the radio sets and all of that stuff so yeah. Uh, I think some of the formative moments were uh, some of the various different parties that would happen around the country that we, we would go to there was like the, the one puff parties there was the early 50 50 parties in Sydney there was the reload parties uh, that that were really 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 kicking off and I think the Melbourne Sydney clashes that we had back in I think 2011, uh, which were insane, uh, they they were massive. I think things like the Risky Roads uh, video that Smash Brothers did, the uh, the P110 Alex Jones did. 
Don't play with us, me just cause I'm raised in Australia That I won't go crazy, I still take your bitch like later bruh I don't even know the name of us, you wanna play, I've got a little game for her If she wanna sing on my track, it's only right we run a train on her That kind of stuff, you know, Shadow going viral with his uh, vocal of Rhythm and Gash uh, you know, Hazard going viral with his with his th with his uh, early video. Uh, that he, I can't even remember what it was called now, the but the response, yeah, yeah, and that was massive. Yeah, that was like over a million views. I'm a skeptic. Retweeted that. Samurai sword, katana. Obviously, the 50/50 events did a lot for the younger artists coming through. <laughs> gave them a platform which then kind of went from zero to 100 for, for a lot of those young artists that came to 50-50 at the start. So potentially that had a lot to do with uh, more people having like a spotlight on them and things like that. And from there, that age bracket's obviously ready for what's happening. So they all jumped on it. Any other moments within those shows that stood out? I think first time seeing Wombat on stage was cool when he was just this young guy. He had no real, you know, not many people knew who he was and he's just starting out and he was hard, man. He's fresh, his bars, his flow, the way he was ah, mad on the stage. That was a moment for me. I was like, these lot have got it. They've, they've got the grime vibe, like the first gen of MCs who grew up on grime, not that have done some or whatever. They grew up on grime. Wombat and those boys, they grew up on it. So watching how they had taken it and it made it into their own thing, you know, Wombat talking about I rock up to grumpy, grumpies in my gumboots, like, he made it his little Aussie thing, you know, and I, I like that. I love hearing Aussie bars, Aussie slang. Like, personally, I think people use too much English slang. I want to hear more Australian. Murky was like just like a massive ball of energy. Like he, you could, he would annoy the hell out of you, and but also in, he was so in, you know endear himself to you, like so many ways uh, he was a big dude like he was he would break everything in his way if you're recording recording in the booth he would he broke the floor numerous times you wouldn't want him in his studio he was just massive energy like a huge grime fan like it was infectious he loved grime uh, and yeah like i say it was infectious he he pushed he pushed everyone like when you're on a on a light on a at a rave or something you know what i mean he would be one geeing you up you know what i mean even even if he was nothing to do with the event, he just loved grime. I remember, you know, Wombat, his first uh, grime event was 50-50. No, no one knew who he was. Turned up, spat a bar, and it was Murky that gave him the wheel up, reached over and wheeled, wheeled it back. And, you know, I know I've spoken to Wombat since, you know, he remembers that, you know, it's like important things like that, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, and I think I G'd Wombat up, you know what I mean? I don't think it's headed as a casket feel But I should have taken the money after pill Call your lawyer, draft your will On your ass clock to a bar sharp as steel I ain't Steven Seagal hard to kill Hot pump cuddies, you'll get bodied I never hear pushing up a for deal Back to back with a smash, that's a hazard attack for real Murky was undeniable like the most energetic geezer I've ever met When he come in the room, you knew he was in the room Whether that be physically or you just sensed his energy or whatever He was a, he was a larger than life character, he really was um, we see little glimpses of him in other people now. And it, it, it you know, I'm not going to go into the details, but yeah, we see little bits of him in other people. And, 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 you know, he was a very specific guy. He wasn't just someone who you'd forget. You meet him, you will remember this guy. Like, he was very loud, you know? And as far as, like, his, his bars and his talent, like, my guy's brain moved so quick, at times he couldn't finish the last idea because he was already moving on to the next thing, you know? Like he's highly creative, like very creative. Strange, I think some of, the, some of us are a little bit strange in our own way, you know, we, we capped ourselves and yeah, he, he, was, he was an out there guy, man. He really was a hell of a personality. Um, now I get gassed thinking about how gassed Murky would be. Like anybody that, anybody that knows him knows he would be the most gassed out of everybody in the scene. Like, really, really. He absolutely loved music and he just wanted to see it get to where it actually is now. A pain inside out, another lost life, another grave to pass by. Rest in peace, Murky, we'll never let your name die out. I do this for you now and for the Smash crew now and anyone that held me down and got me through. Got a lot of love for the ones who stayed true. Uh, well, Smash Brothers has never really been uh, a crew that's released much music, you know what I mean? We've never... Uh, 
it's more it's more a friend thing friendship thing and you know and a live thing so i don't know whether we're gonna we'll ever see smash brothers releases you know uh, we've got 10 20 tunes recorded you know some with murky as well but whether they ever see the light of day don't know but we'll continue doing our thing and you know doing we'll always work with each other and we'll we'll always do live sets together but as far as releases go i'm not too sure but you know i think australian grind's gonna go going to go from strength to strength. There's so many people are getting into it now and it seems to be the genre that kids are, uh, are, are going to now rather than, rather than uh, straight hip hop, you know, but I hope just that people maintain, uh, will understand what the, what the music is and do some research into history. It's not just hip hop, you know, so when I see, I see a lot of people saying, oh, my favorite grime artist is this or so, and you know, they've never even spat on a grime tune, you know, I mean, understand what the genre is. It's not hip hop, it's something else, you know what I mean? And, you know, do your research into the, into the history of it and learn, learn the culture, basically. Don't come back around chatting about man and get vexed, put the hammer down, yeah, we can have it out. But that ain't fair, cause you don't know now about Pun Pao, fearless like Chun Tao, sit a man down with a lark sow, get yammed like a bag of art. You know, you've got the drill scene coming through now and people jump on whatever's hot. And I think a lot of people probably jumped on grime for the same reason. So it will be interesting to see whether or not it keeps momentum up or whether people start to stray into other genres or more new genres that are coming through, offsets of you know, what it was to start with. Who knows? But I'd like to see it progress. I'd like to see it become a lot more uh, radio, a lot more radio sets, a lot more people going on Triple J and a lot more of the mainstream media and people like that taking kind of taking notice of it. When Alex Jones puts out his next release, it could go anywhere. It could go all the way to the top. Before you know it, Alex could be featuring with Getz and JK and all these guys that are smashing it because he is that good. I have no idea where it's gonna go next. I just, I don't know, man. Like, as long as we just, everybody stays true to it and just does their music for the love of the music. Um, as soon as people get corrupted with motivations that can stray you away from the path that you were once on. So yeah, man, that's, I have no idea where it's going, mate. I really couldn't tell you. I reckon someone's gonna go number one. That's one thing I would say.